Hello. So today's video has been, I suppose, requested by my psychologist. Today's video may be slightly different as I need to keep in mind that my audience is also for staff, more specifically for staff training complex needs. If anything is directed more towards staff, then, then that's why, rather than how I, I usually speak. To begin with, I've been asked just to give a general overview of what living with BPD is like. Before I was diagnosed, the, the simplest way I could describe living with it is, rather than being up and down all the time, I was up, down, left, right and centre. Um, it, it wasn't about feeling happy versus sad, it was feeling happy, sad, and everything in between. Within minutes I could go from feeling euphoria to intense anger. I couldn't understand what was causing these extreme mood swings. It ultimately just left me in a constant state of confusion and frustration and that goes for the people who were surrounding me. I had zero control. It threw me in and out of depressive episodes and no one could keep up. My identity was stricken and I for a long time felt I'd become the illness. It took a long time for me to, to separate myself from it. I feel this is something that most people suffering with mental illness will need to do eventually. For a long time it was a case of I am borderline personality disorder until a matey mad was born. <laughs> It came about first quite jokingly, um, just to sort of describe my um, crazier uh, side, <laughs> but it actually kind of stuck in the end, and it was that first step into uh, separating myself from her. I thought she was me, but she's not, she's a part of me. And having that in mind, it, it becomes a lot more easier to deal with. It's not so suffocating. She sometimes now is my strength. Um, but for a long time was a big weakness. And now we're learning to work together. Where I'm at now, finding I can control it more. I do find myself almost in a constant argument with MAD Mad. She's my instinctual way of thinking and behaving. It's the way I have been since a child. It's the, it's the, the way I know best. Now with the, the work I've been doing over the last year or so is about challenging those thoughts and behaviours which can be hard sometimes. I find myself spiralling over it, sort of doubting the way I've ever felt or thought. I'll be left feeling like it's, it's unfair, why should I have to correct the way I think or behave, why can't that just be right? And it can, but then you know I've got to be honest with myself. There, there's patterns in my in my in my life of things not working out, and, that, and that's you know due to the way MAD Mad thinks. It, it needs tweaking. <laughs> there's no linear way of describing living with BPD. One minute it's extremely lonely and tiring and isolating, and the next it's filled with intense happiness and optimism. And sometimes this optimism borders on delusional. It's anger, you know, my heart will be full of hate. And then it all flip it on its head and I feel nothing. The world is nothing. I've run out of emotion. It doesn't exist in me anymore. Uh, it's really hard and draining. And all of this has a knock-on effect. Because of it, I, I had to drop out of college. I couldn't work. My relationships with people have suffered massively friends family partners uh all of it every kind of relationship suffered and still does and for a long time i hated myself <laughs> uh moving on you know despite the the work i put in in therapy relationships is one of the things that i still struggle with the most and i, I don't think that's uncommon i think that's quite common amongst us all with bpd it's one of the I suppose topics that I, I notice the illness in most. I find myself splitting a lot of the time. I'll have two people, two friends, and one may say something about, I don't know, the other, and I'll completely switch my view on them and I'll hate them and I'll think they're pure evil and this other person is amazing and can do no wrong. And there, there may not even be any reason for that. You know, they might do nothing and 
I just switch and that is just how I feel. I love this person and I hate this person and th there's nothing to back it up. For a long time I was unaware of this and found myself, you know, uh, I sort of mentioned this in my first BBD video, sort of confused and lost and I couldn't remember why I felt these ways about someone but the more and more I learn about the illness I realise now what it is and I can challenge that and not believe everything that I think. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice and work and effort and again doubting myself but it has to be done because it's it's caused so many relationships to fail and and that's just not what I, I want. It's hard. I have an intense need for closeness yet I find myself running away from it a lot of the time. It's this fear of abandonment of, and rejection that stays prevalent in in all aspects of relationships, you know, making them, keeping them, um, do you know what I mean? I get paranoid, I overthink, like I say, to a, to a delusional standard and communication skills are, are pretty poor. And none of this has helped when it comes to getting help. Some of the people I've encountered over the years, uh, well, um, you've got the good, you've got the bad, and you just got the plain old shit. Is a little tip if they if they never I don't know taught it in your your psyche med school. Um, if you if you've got someone who's suicidal, don't tell them that until they've attempted it, they can't be taken seriously and regarded as needing help. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can uh, fill in what happened next. So I put it out there to some of the people in my group that I'm in currently on sort of what they, they find helpful and unhelpful of um of staff and services and we sort of we all had generally the, the same idea and gist of things. So it's not it's not just uh, me. Uh, these things they're quite general, but it goes you know, whatever. I find when staff aren't upfront and honest about things, let's say if we're talking about wait times for appointments or groups or therapy or whatever, of course you can only estimate to the best of your ability because we all know what services are like but there's a difference between saying it'll be a couple months to if it's realistically actually more like six to nine to twelve months, you know I'd rather have the, the brutal honesty but know where I stand um, rather than just being oh, oh it'll be a couple months uh, being told that what is a couple months do you know what I mean and then I, I feel left like I need to keep chasing it up and I, you know I don't want to I feel awkward and embarrassed to keep prodding and then ultimately you, you're left feeling like you've been lost in the system because it just the weight just feels like it's going on forever because you don't have any idea of an end time to avoid that, you know, keep patients updated um, to the best of your knowledge, obviously, but they're all, they're all helps. It's hard enough getting to the point of being recognised as needing help. The wait is, you know, sometimes even harder because at that point you've done all you can do as a as a patient and now the, the ball's in your court. We're waiting for you to give us the green flag of, yes, we can do this and we can do it now or whenever. Be on the ball and like sort of keep keep us informed. It's just gonna lead to spirals and overthinking and just and it's just worse. It's just worse. So yeah. Another thing, don't patronise me, particularly when it comes to my age. Being on the on the younger side of the spectrum in adult services, this happens a lot. Not just with staff, with with other people, other patients as well. It's a massive pet peeve of mine. I've been made to feel naive and small and stupid. What would I know? I haven't lived through the illness as long as others, but I, I just think that's a load of bollocks. Illnesses can present themselves at different times in people's lives. Just because I'm younger doesn't mean I haven't suffered suffered for as long as older patients. I, I'm sure I, I haven't suffered longer than anyone. I, I'm not the, the longest running of suffering, but I'm possibly and probably not the shortest. I shouldn't be a certain age to feel entitled to being ill. It's not a game of who, who can be the illest and therefore is the most entitled, I guess. Another thing is, is don't undermine me. I say me, I, I, I'm regarding us, all of us. BPD is a very confusing illness. We struggle to keep up with it ourselves. It's understandable if it, you know, as a 
someone else who doesn't have it um, is struggling to keep up with it and understand but you know we're all sort of on the same page with that if something we explain doesn't entirely make sense it doesn't mean it's wrong or untrue you know not always but sometimes we need validation it's important for us to feel understood because for I'm sure before and early stages of like being diagnosed it, it's such a confusing and misunderstood illness so feeling not alone in it um it is it's helpful um, and i think that's sort of a another i guess benefit of a group environment is you know especially like being in one where you've all got the same illness or traits people will tell their story and people nod along and and it, and it is helpful because then you don't feel so weird for feeling that way i guess it, it just gives it more of a, a united feeling and it's just less lonely <laughs> and i guess be patient. A lot of us struggle to trust people, particularly in group situations or just therapy in general. It doesn't have to be a group. Talking and communicating is hard and it's something that can be very daunting at first. Especially coming from my, my own personal experiences. In the past, if I've tried to, to say something and it and it's come across wrong and that person has reacted badly because they've misunderstood, I'll come to therapy environments with this preconception that they're going to react the same way and, and I don't want that to happen again you know like I say relationships is very important to us and we don't want to keep fucking them up we're going to be a bit more guarded and have more boundaries and a wall and just allow it do you know what I mean just give it time don't try and knock the wall over because you're going to go on the flip side and we're going to split and we're going to hate you <sighs> we're confusing <laughs> we're annoying <laughs> no Ultimately, we just we need time to gauge who we are communicating with, and we need just time to to trust them, you know, to build a rapport, you know, get to know them on a on a more not deeper level, but like further than just therapy based work. And being classic BPD, on the flip side, sometimes we trust too much, <laughs> and um, if you let us down through our eyes, that's it. You're you're completely lose us potentially you know, yes we're, we're we're tricky i know I, well, i'm speaking for myself really i'm tricky but yeah we're kind of tricky we're kind of tricky <laughs> so in that case all i can suggest is just being as, as human as possible try not to totally abide by your scripts when you say or ask things that we all know you've read in like a how to be a therapist book you know you're gonna kind of kind of gonna lose us a bit and we're gonna be a bit like cut the cliche shit it's fine you know sometimes but not all the time just tone down the the robotic side and be a bit more human <laughs> that's it keep it real keep it honest and um be open and that way you're less likely to be a uh, hated <laughs> someone who i'll always remember and hold as someone that i worked really well with was my care coordinator who is unfortunately now left but we worked together for a year and a half ish you know, she was sort of my first port of call from transitioning out of hospital and into outpatients. She was uh, very good at talking to me like, like we're just two normal people in a room meeting. She was sort of like a friend who had had a bit more training. <laughs> she was versatile. Um, if I didn't want to do sign or wasn't up to doing certain work, then that's fine. We'll change it and mould it around that day. Every day is different. So you need that versatility and flexibility, I guess, because we're, like I say, it's not linear. She was patient, you know, we, we spent a long time being quite off, but it was just, it was necessary time to build a rapport on each other and, you know, like I say, gauge each other. And by the end, she could read me like a book, pretty much. And that was okay at that point because she'd earned to do that. She had been patient and she had taken time for me to trust her and all I'm gonna do is respect that. I know certain job descriptions have their limitations, but she would go that that extra bit. She would help me inside and outside of the resource center. And I really appreciate the work that she, she did to help me not only with mental stuff, but physical stuff that was going on in my life. It was hard to let her go, which leads on to my next point of, as service users, we all know that our time will end with staff. So as my Keiko suggested upon, you know, approaching her, her leaving, we did some work based around separating. 
<laughs> Sounds like we're married. You know, and I, I found this really helpful. Like, you know, tailoring work to circumstances, I think is important because that, that's the practicality of it. You, you need practicality to the work that you're doing. And also, I think particularly when it came to her leaving, that is quite um, a significant thing to someone who suffers with BPD, you know, because over time we grow to trust them and we get attached. And when they leave, it's like a stab in the back because we get attached and then we have this fear of abandonment and rejection and it's a big trigger so it, it, it was vital and, and very good on her part to recognize that was something that needed to be uh, concentrated on uh, at the end so she suggested that we wrote letters to each other to read on our last session it of course was hard but it sort of ended our chapter on a nice note rather than sort of her just leaving me behind with just another old job of hers. It showed that she sort of cared and cared about the work we'd done and wasn't just gonna toss me aside. <laughs> it sort of safeguarded for that, I suppose, almost for her benefit. Possibly if we hadn't have done this preparation work for her leaving, my head, I'm sure, could have turned or had more reason to split and hate her because she wanted to move on with her life, which is completely fine, but in, in the darker times in my brain that's not fine because it's all about me and I'm selfish which isn't good and <laughs> oh fuck reading letters to each other it just made the whole thing more human it broke down that barrier that some staff have of patient and staff member it, it made it less clinical a lot of people get caught up in abiding by the rules and being very strict and you're you and you're you and we are separate blur the lines a bit it, it's only going to benefit that patient's recovery because the better relationship we have with our therapist or whoever the the more likely there's going to be positive work and change come out of that so I think we'll wrap it up a bit here, but um, I think overall, BPD patients, we just need a little bit more leeway. We just need a little bit extra patience and just a bit more reassurance. We're just like any other person, but just a little bit more intense. <laughs> All human, you're human as a staff member, we're human as patients. Just use your initiative and just don't forget that we are technically all equal it doesn't matter why we're there and why we've come together and your position and my position at the end of the day you take us out of a mental health center we're just all people so yeah i think that'll do thank you as always for watching and um yeah i hope you've enjoyed hopefully it's helpful cheers goodbye jesus christ <laughs>